Our scripture reading in Acts chapter 9, verse 4. Acts chapter 9, verse 4. This is the story of the conversion of Saul, who we know to be Paul. It says, And he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? There are two things that can keep a person from receiving the Holy Spirit. How many things? There are two things that can keep a person from receiving the Holy Spirit. And those two I want to talk about this morning. And those two, Saul, or Paul as we know him, had those two things. The first one is an unsubmissive attitude. An unsubmissive attitude. Arrogance. They're just arrogant. If a person is an arrogant person, unsubmissive attitude, the Holy Spirit cannot come into that person. And number two, an unwilling to admit when they are wrong. An un, a person unwilling to admit they're wrong, unwilling to apologize. And we're going to see today that a person who is unwilling to admit they're wrong and a person who is unwilling to submit to the Lord cannot, cannot be saved. And my desire is that every single one of us, friends, is in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I ask you for your Holy Spirit and that we submit to him. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now why why can't an unsubmissive person or a person unwilling to admit the wrong be saved? Well, because it is a sign or it is being defiant to God. Sin comes as defiance against God, as open defiance. And if the defiance toward God is not cut or not stopped, it just increases. They get more defiant. Now, do you know what defiance is? Yes? No? Have you seen a defiant child? <laughs> a defiant teenager? You know, they don't care what the parent says, they're not going to do it. A, def a defiance is, is a person who does not care what any authority says. They're going to do what they say because, they, because they're going to do what they say. <laughs> They don't care, a defiant child or, or teenager does not care what the parents say or think. And they go against parental authority. Now if you're a parent like I am, that really boils me up. <laughs> no, knowing that even if my children are considering a defiant attitude, and I pray to the, to the Lord to help me keep my hands on my side, because defiance is, 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 an op is open rebellion. And there's, there are two things that, that my sister and I grew up with, knowing that our mother uh, could not stand at all. Number one is a lie. A lie where she'd rather know the truth, even if it hurt her, than a lie. And number two is being a defiant child. Being a defiant child. My sister and I could not give a defiant look, a defiant response, a defiant attitude, or even a defiant tone of voice. And we knew, we knew the wrath of a defiant response. <laughs> we knew that just by the snap of our fingers, or by the, a certain look, you know, that we either had to get in line or pay for the consequences. And there, there were times where, where we did have a defiance attitude. And I want to praise the Lord, and I know this is being recorded, and I know she is going to hear it probably sometime today. But I want to praise the Lord because my mom did not put up with my sister and I being defiant. Amen. Amen. She had no problem in practicing the belt. She had no problem in disciplining us. And I want to praise the Lord for that. I thank God for her not putting, because defiance only increases. Yes. If it's not cut, 
It continues to increase and get more bolder and bolder. And we'll look at an example. If you turn with me to the book of Isaiah. Turn to the book of Isaiah and we'll see how bad it can be. Isaiah chapter 14. If defiance is not cut, if it's not turned over to the Holy Spirit, see how far it can get. Isaiah chapter 14. Here is the fall of Lucifer, where defiance even came from. There we see in verse 12, Isaiah 14, verse 12, where it says, How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations, for you have said in your heart, and this is where defiance starts. Notice what Lucifer said in his heart. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. On the far east side of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. What's something that you keep noticing there? I, yes. I and I, but something else. Do you notice on how he's getting even more bolder and more defiant? He started out with, well, I just want a better position and escalated to, well, I just want to replace God. Defiant kept on escalating and escalating and escalating. And that is what happens, friends, in our hearts when we are defiant against God. If we... If it is not subdued, it continues to increase and increase. And sometimes it gets to the point that we may say, well, I don't find that necessary. I don't think that that part of scripture is necessary. And there are some examples of defiance that I want to share with you. Besides this one here in Isaiah, if you turn to Genesis chapter 4, you remember this story in there in Genesis chapter 4. The first two children that Adam and Eve had, Cain and Abel, and one of them murdered the other one. There in Genesis chapter 4, verse 9, and God still uh, talking to Cain, he says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? Now the, the Lord knew where he was. But he's trying, he is trying to reach the heart of Cain. He's trying to reach the heart of Cain. Just how he was trying to reach when he asked Adam, where are you? When he had eat, eaten of the forbidden fruit. So, so there, what does, what does Cain say? And he said, I don't know. Just that answer is, defi is being defined against God. And then he escalates it a little higher. Am I my brother's keeper? Can you picture that conversation with God? I can't even picture that conversation with my parents. <laughs> I can't. My mother, if, if, if my mother would ask me, where is your sister? If I didn't know, I would say, I don't know. And my next response, do you want me to go look for her? Or can I, you know? But I would never say, am I her bodyguard? <laughs> I wouldn't be standing right here. <laughs> Can you imagine the boldness of defiance here, Cain? Am I my brother's keeper? You can see other, other examples of defiance toward God there when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah and he, told, and he told Lot and his family, don't look back. And yet Lot's wife, in defiance, looked back. Saul, not Saul of, of Tarsus, but Saul, the first king of Israel, when he offered that sacrifice that he was not supposed to offer there in 1 Samuel 13, he was defiant against God. Against God. So turning back to Acts, to the book of Acts, what does this have to do with Paul? And what does it have to do with him getting knocked off his horse? Well, friends, he was knocked off his horse because of defiance in his heart, being defiant toward God. He was knocked off his horse because he, was unsub he had an unsubmissive attitude toward God. He was unwilling to admit if he was wrong. 
If you turn to Acts chapter 7, let's just see what type of person Paul was. They're in, they're in Acts chapter 7, verse 58. Verse 58, this is the stoning of Stephen. And what, what part does Paul have here? It says, and they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the, and the witness laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul was there enjoying the execution and supporting the execution of Stephen as well. Notice Acts chapter 8 there in verse 1. The type of person that, that Paul was. There it says, Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made, and made great lamentation over him. Verse 3, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Does somebody else have a, a different translation? He began to destroy. He had, he had this, this, this evilness against the church. Entering, notice, entering every house and not just asking them to come out. What does it say? Dragging off men and women. And you can include their and children. Committing them to prison. Here Saul had no compassion at all. No compassion, not even for women or children. If they professed to be Christian, they would drag them out. No compassion. And notice, friends, Saul is a religious man. You would expect that from somebody who's non-religious. But Saul was a religious man who, who claimed to follow the God of Abraham, God of Jacob and Israel. The same God that the apostles also claim to follow. The same God you and I follow. The only true God of heaven. And here a religious man having no compassion. Friends, this is a big lesson. Because we are religious people. But are we compassion? Or do we show no compassion? Are we compassion with new believers? You know, everyone, everyone is at a different level in their walk with Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Everyone is in a different level in their walk with Christ. And some people who are not compassion easily persecute, as Saul did, those baby Christians. Here is Saul with no compassion. And Saul did not, Saul did not believe in any compromise. In any compromise. In Saul's mind, it's either my way or the highway. That's why he wanted to eliminate them. Church, <laughs> you better be happy that Saul is not your pastor. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Because Saul would have taken lot, many of you already out of the, of the church with no compassion. No compromise. It's my way or, or, or that's it. So Saul was a religious person unwilling to submit to the Holy Spirit. And what did we talk about last week? Do you re remember what we talked about last week? The, the sin of Ananias and Sapphira. That they ignored and ignored and ignored the Holy Spirit. And here Saul was, did not submit to the Holy Spirit. He ignored the Holy Spirit. A religious person unwilling to submit to the Holy Spirit is a dangerous person, friends. A religious person unwilling, unbending to submit to the Holy Spirit, and that's a dangerous person. And we must be more than just religious people filled with doctrines and Bible texts. Because Saul was filled with scripture. Saul knew, Saul knew the Pentateuch by memory. We can't beat that. Saul could, could recite Genesis to Deuteronomy. We can barely do Genesis 1 and 2. 
He was full of scripture and religion, but not full of the Holy Spirit. Religion without the presence of Christ in the life, it creates arrogance and it creates persecutors. It's a, it's, a, it's a mentality that I am right and that you are wrong. And actually, we know today that the greatest terrorists today are religious people. The greatest terrorists in the world are religious people without the Holy Spirit. And don't forget, we know how the story ends. Religious people are going to put us in jail. Have you read The Great Controversy? Religious people are going to put us in jail. So if you are a religious, if you are religious and the Spirit of God doesn't own your life, friends, you are a dangerous person. Because then you become judgmental, unreasonable, unbending, unsubmissive, and therefore impossible to save. If we are, a, if we are religious, but without, filled with the Holy Spirit, we are a dangerous person, friends, because we are judgmental, unreasonable, unbending, unsubmissive, and unsavable. Meanwhile, that remains. Meanwhile, that re remains. That's why I say that, that if it's not cut, if defiance is not eliminated, it just increases and increases and increases. And unfortunately, there are Adventists just like Saul that they know plenty of scripture, they know plenty of prophecy, they're unbending, judgmental, and you just can't stand being around them. With all of this, Saul lacked the basic of Christianity, a complete dependence on God and a complete submission to him. And that's why there, in Acts chapter 9, Saul, in verse 1, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Notice in verse 1 there in chapter 9, then saw still breathing threats. This just increases and increases. He wasn't satisfied with just Jerusalem. He wanted to get them wherever they were. They're in Damascus, let's go get them there. They're in Samaria, let's go get them there. The defiance just increased and increased. Now what is, you might have asked yourself, what is up with this title? What is today's sermon's title? We don't need more of the Holy Spirit. And we don't. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit needs more of you. The Holy Spirit, we, the, the Holy Spirit is already pouring on us and trying to reach us. But if we keep ignoring him and ignoring him, we don't need more of the Holy Spirit. He's, right, he's already right here. He needs more of us to break down that wall and say, here, have my heart. Fill my life. Let, him, let your will be done and not my will be done. Saul, the excellent Sabbath keeper, faithful tithe returner, non-pork eater, excellent Sabbath keeper, conservative Saul, suddenly found himself flat on his back, knocked off his horse. Why? Because he was not willing to admit he, he was wrong when he was wrong and he had an unsubmissive attitude. He was arrogant. He was full of himself and religion, but not full of the Holy Spirit. And in order to save him, friends, God had to knock him off his high horse. God had to knock him off. We are living in the last days. And yet I believe that we are not ready. 
because there are areas that we are not willing to admit that we're wrong. And there are areas that we are not willing to submit completely, 100% to God. We can have all the scripture, all the knowledge, all the, all the prophecy dates, and all the information, and all the Bible truths. We can be the best vegetarians, best Sabbath keepers, but if we are not willing to admit we're wrong when we're wrong, and we are not willing to submit and subdue to God, to the Holy Spirit, friends, God will have no choice but to dis destroy you. Not in an act of angry, of angerness, of, of, of being angry, but an, an act of mercy. An act of mercy. God destroyed the antediluvians, not because of his wrath of anger, but because they were more defiant and defiant, and it was an act of mercy that he cut their life short. God rather knock you and me off our high horse then see us be burned in the lake of fire with Lucifer. Amen. Amen. God rather knock us off our horse than see us walking down the wrong path. The wrong path. Friends, we are familiar with this, with this story. And this Sabbath is just the first half of chapter 9. And here we see Saul where he, where, where, where he even says himself, when he describes himself, zealous from the tribe of Benjamin, the Pharisees of Pharisees. Otherwise, no one could beat Saul in theology, no one could beat Saul in Bible knowledge, no one could beat Saul as being a religious person. But what does Paul say? I count all that as dung. I count, I count all that as trash. And actually the word dung is more than trash. You know what dung is. It's manure. Paul here says, I count all that as rubbish. Because why? Because he is not filled with the Holy Spirit. He'd rather be filled with the Holy Spirit and have the love of Christ than being religious without the Holy Spirit. And that's why last, last message ties in with this one that we need to be careful that we do not ignore the voice of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is talking to us every single day, every single time. Every good thought you get about doing doesn't come from you or from myself. We cannot take any credit from any good thing that we do. It's the Holy Spirit that is impressing on us. It's the, it's, it's the Holy Spirit who told you this morning, get dressed, let's, let's go to church. It's the Holy Spirit who tells you, don't forget to read your scripture today. Don't forget to talk to your Heavenly Father today. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts you, oh, I shouldn't have said that little lie. It's still a lie. I shouldn't have done this. It's the Holy Spirit who is talking and impressing in our hearts, friends. And if we keep on ignoring and ignoring the Holy Spirit, God will knock us off our horse and we will be found flat on our face. And we can still even be defiant, but God is trying to reach us to the utmost. To the utmost. That's why the Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 10. Do we know what James 4, verse 10? If you look there in James chapter 4, verse 10. James chapter 4, verse 10. The Bible says, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. See, God is, is telling us, you humble yourself because you don't want me to humble you. Because when God humbles you, friends, you will never forget it. You will never forget it. If God needs to take away your goods, take away your job, God needs to dig deep to get your attention, knowing that that will turn you around, He will do it, friends. Because nothing beats being in heaven, walking in the kingdom of God. 
Nothing can beat that here on earth. Absolutely nothing. Humble yourself. And I like to remind you, it says, humble yourself, not humble your neighbor. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We like to humble our neighbor. We're, we're good at humbling our neighbor and sometimes even good at humbling our spouses. But God says, humble yourself. Take care of yourself first. Also, 1 Peter 5, verse 6. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. You see, when Lucifer was being defiant and defiant and defiant, what ended up, to him, what ended up happening to Lucifer? There in Isaiah 14, it, it says what? He was what? Cast down. And the same thing will happen. We are defiant against God and defiant and want our way and think that we know better than, than the Lord. You know, and sometimes our defiance even comes in, in, in statements that, well, I think that the scripture actually means this. You know, I'm so glad because you will never find a scripture that asks us what we think. <laughs> God is not interested in what we think. That's why, friends, the, the devil was defiant and defiant and defiant and he was cast down. He was brought down. And you and I will be brought down if we are defiant and defiant and defiant. God will no knock off the legs and cast you down. Yet Jesus, Philippians, tells us in Philippians that Jesus was what? He was brought down, humbled himself, became a servant, and the Lord what? Lifted him up. Lifted him up. I heard, I, I, heard, uh, I heard a pastor say, the way up to heaven is the way down. The way up to heaven is the way down. Humbling yourself. Becoming a servant. Humble yourself. It doesn't say lift yourself. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. He will lift you up. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you and in due time he will exalt you. He will exalt you. Friends, God will knock you off your horse to get you to the kingdom of heaven if he has to. But his desire and his will is that we humble ourselves. Is that we humble ourselves. And Saul had plenty of, of opportunity to humble himself. When you read the book of Acts and you read his letters to the, to the churches, you see that example. But yet he would not humble himself so that the Lord had to humble him. The Lord had to humble him. We don't like to admit that we're wrong, but we are wrong. Because we're born wrong. And we become comfortable with the wrong that is in us. With the wrong that is in us. And so my appeal to you today, my appeal to you today, is not merely how many want to submit more. I know every hand would rise up. It's, I'm not going to ask how many have, have been defined to the Lord. That's none of my business. That's none of my business. Which, by the way, friends, talking about none of my business. You know, showing compassion to others is part of a Christian walk. Showing compassion to others. If you know of another brother or sister that may be still doing things that they shouldn't be doing, friends, the best thing you can do is pray for them and mind your own business. Amen. Amen. Showing compassion showing compassion that God will guide them into the Christian, mature Christian that they will become. Amen. So my appeal to you is that we pray this week, that we pray today for a submissive heart. 
And you only know in yourselves, in your heart of hearts, if you are submissive or if you are a defiant person. You only know. It's only between you and God. And so I just appeal to you that you pray this week for submissiveness to God that he may work and mold you into his likeness. Because if God needs to, he will knock you off your horse or he will take you off your throne as he did with Nebuchadnezzar. He took him off his throne for seven years he was out in the wilderness until he recognized the true God of heaven, friends. But what was the end result? He will be walking in the streets of gold. Amen. Amen. Nothing can beat that. Nothing here on earth can beat that. Because when Jesus comes, friends, everything is going to be destroyed and burned. Everything. So I pray and I appeal to check your heart Really search your heart. And if there is defiance, even just a drop or a 1%, Lord, take it away. Lord, take it away. And I want to submit my life completely to you. Completely to you. You may need to pray, Lord, I don't see anything wrong with this act or I don't see anything wrong with this relationship. But Lord, your scripture says this, help me to submit to your will. Help me to submit to your will. That is my prayer and that is my desire, friends. May God bless you. Richly, richly bless you. And as we're learning here from the story of Saul, which we will continue the next time I speak, if you look at the meditation there for today, did Saul have a turnaround change? <clears throat> did Saul continue to be defiant? After he was knocked down? No. no. The meditation from Acts of the Apostles says, As Saul yielded himself fully to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, he saw the mistakes of his life and recognized the far-reaching claims of the law of God. He who, he who had been a proud Pharisee, confident that he was justified by his good works, now bow before God with the humility and simplicity of a little child, confessing his own unworthiness and pleading the merits of a crucified and risen Savior. Saul's heart was touched and changed. Saul longed to come into full harmony and communion with the Father and the Son. And in the intensity of his desire of pardon and acceptance he offered up fervent supplication to the throne of grace and did God hear his prayer you better believe it friends will God hear your prayer even if you are as stubborn as Saul God will still hear your prayer and heal your unsubmissive heart your arrogant attitude he will heal it and change it friends you know, I have been told you can't teach a dog new tricks. Have you heard that? What does that refer to? A person will stay the way they are forever. If that is true, then there is no power in God. But you can take, teach a dog new tricks. Amen. By the power of God is the only way. Not by your own strength, no. But by the power of God. A person's character can change. A person's attitude can change. And if God needs to get your attention by somehow knocking you off your high horse or my high horse, He will. And my prayer is that don't let it get to that point. Don't let it get to that point. Humble yourself before the Lord. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and He'll lift you up, friends. He will lift you up. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, you are coming very soon. Very, very soon. And Lord, your Holy Spirit is always with us 
And we sometimes pray for more of the Holy Spirit, but we actually need to surrender more of our hearts to the Holy Spirit. He needs more of us. And help us to be more submissive and to admit that we're wrong when we're wrong. So Father, forgive us if we have been defiant toward you in any way, in any way. Lord, thank you because you love us so much that you would do whatever it takes to get our attention to look to heaven and to cling and ask forgiveness from you. And thank you because just you, you not only forgave Saul, but he became a powerful worker for you. And we can become powerful workers for you. But we need to be filled with your Holy Spirit. Not just religious people knowing lots of scripture, but religious people knowing lots of scripture and filled with the Holy Spirit. Be with your church. Be with your people. Not just here in the Cleburne Church, but everywhere in the world, Lord. You know those are searching for you. Continue to bring them to your word, to the light of truth. Bless your church here and everywhere. In Jesus' name I ask, in Jesus' name I pray, amen.